Welcome to section 12.3. All right, gentle people, we're going to continue our discussion on quantum mechanics. And now what we're going to do is focus in on the atom. So the first thing we can take a look at is this picture right here. Now, what you will see here is white light is coming into a prism. Now, what this prism is going to do is it's going to separate this white light and it's going to go ahead and show all the component colors that make up this white light. So if I were to go up to the sunlight, the sun travels a long distance and interacts with a whole bunch of stuff. We get this white light shining through. And what you guys can see is if I split up the components of that white light, that white light is made out of all the colors of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, and violet. But what's more is that if you look at the spectrum of colors that you see, what you guys will see is a continuous spectrum, meaning there's no gaps between going from red to orange. I have every wavelength in between blue and indigo. And so what I have are no gaps and I get the full breadth of colors. Now let's go ahead and do the same experiment with a hydrogen lamp. And the idea here is that I take hydrogen, I give it a whole bunch of energy using electricity, and what it will do is my hydrogen will start to glow. So when I take the light from my hydrogen lamp and I go ahead and put it through this same kind of prism, so I input the light, and then what I want to see is what I get on the other side. And what I don't get is I don't get a continuous spectrum. I get what's called a line spectrum. So if I were to split up that hydrogen light, what I get are the components of that light. And what you guys will see is there are big gaps between the colors. In fact, what I only see is a narrow range of colors that come out, or a line of colors. I get light coming at 656.2, so red light. And then there's this big gap of wavelengths until I get to my green light at 486. Again, another big gap, and then I get to 434, another gap, and then 410. So the point I want to drive home here is that if I look at sunlight, which is going through all these interactions, I get the world as a ramp. However, if I look at hydrogen atom and I look at the pure light without any interference, what I get is the world as a ladder. I'm only seeing certain energies come out of my hydrogen. And it seems that hydrogen is only allowed to give off light at certain energy values. Now, what this is saying is that my atom is quantized itself. So let's go ahead and expand on our atomic model. So when we last talked about our atomic model, we talked about Rutherford. And he said that the nucleus is at the center. And this is my positive center with my protons and neutrons making up this dense nucleus at the center. And then he said, well, the electrons are around the nucleus. Now what we're going to do is talk about the Bohr model. Now what Bohr says is that because of this spectrum, this line spectrum that I get out of hydrogen, I'm going to say my atom is quantized. And yes, we have a nucleus with all the positive protons in the center and the nucleus in the center, but my electrons, I'm going to go ahead and define them a little bit more. Instead of my electrons being anywhere in the atom, what I'm going to say is that the electrons can only be in certain orbits. These orbits are a certain distance away from our center nucleus. You can kind of envision this as a mini solar system where the sun or our nucleus is in the middle, and then I have planets rotating around at discrete orbits. In between the planets, I won't find another planet. It is only at these fixed orbits where I will find an electron. Now let's say that we look at the hydrogen atom. Now the hydrogen atom is made out of one proton and one electron. 
Now, what's going to happen is that the closest orbit to the nucleus is going to be called n equals 1. Now, this is the lowest energy orbit in which my electron can reside in. And that's because it's closest to the nucleus. If I want to get further and further away, I have to give my electron more energy. So this closest state, n equals 1, is called the ground state. Now, let's say I give this electron energy. Now, what can happen is the electron can move to a different orbit. Now, I want you guys to be careful. It can't go to any orbit. Only certain orbits are around. So the next highest orbit is n equals 2. And if I were to go ahead and give it more energy, n equals 3, getting further and further away from the nucleus. When the electron is not in its lowest energy state, we say that the atom is in the excited state. So let's go ahead and talk about excitation and relaxation. So let's go ahead and say this is my energy. And the energy levels I have is n equals 1, n equals 2, all the way up to n equals 5. n equals 1 is my ground state. And n equals 2 is an excited state where I've given the electron energy so it can go ahead and move to an orbital that is further away and higher in energy. So if I have an electron in its ground state, I can give energy to it. This process is called absorption. What will happen is the electron will move from the ground state to a higher orbital and go into the excited state. Now, I have to give the electron enough energy to make this jump. If I don't give it enough energy, it's gonna, it is going to fall right back to the ground state. Now, once it's in this excited state, we have a high energy atom. And it turns out that nature always likes to go back to the lowest energy form. And so what's going to happen is this electron is going to fall back down. Now, when it falls back down, it has to give up energy. One way it can give up energy is it can go ahead and give up that energy as light energy or a photon of light. This is called an emission process. When I emit a photon of light from an excited state, what I will see is that the energy of that photon corresponds to the drop in energy that electron is going to take. So we can go ahead and calculate the change in energy for each one of these process, an absorption or an emission. Now, whenever we do changes in chemistry, we're going to use the delta symbol. So in this case, we're looking at the delta E or the change in energy. Whenever you use the delta symbol, you're always going to take the final state minus the initial state. So if we were to go ahead and look at the absorption process, this is the electron in the final state, and this is the electron in the initial state. And so the delta E here is going to correspond to the energy to make the jump, or the energy of light that I can absorb to make that jump. Similarly, we can go ahead and calculate the delta E for the energy of emission. So for the second process right here, this is my final energy and this is my initial energy. And again, delta E corresponds to the gap in these energy levels. So going back to our line spectra, now we can make sense of why these lines appear. These lines correspond to an emission of light. They correspond to the jumps or drops an electron is making. Now, because the light is coming out of my hydrogen lamp, these correspond to energy drops. If I have a drop from, say, 3 to 2, what I'm saying is the electron starts at n equals 3 and drops to n equals 2. Now, when it makes this drop, I will go ahead and emit a photon of light. And that corresponds to red light. That's the reason you see only one line here. Because this energy between n equals 3 and n equals 2 is a fixed amount. 
it is quantized. I'm not going to drop halfway in between. And that's why we don't see other colors of light around this. We only see one line. Now, each one of the other colors corresponds to a different transition, meaning I'm going from one orbit to another different orbit. Each one of these energies can be calculated out where the energy equals hc over lambda if I'm looking at the wavelengths of light. Now for a hydrogen lamp, that is called the Bomber series, but there are other jumps that we can go. You'll notice that all the visible light transitions go from n equals something higher to n equals two. If I wanted to go from n equals something to the ground state or n equals one, that would be in the ultraviolet region, and you guys can't see it, but we can use special detectors to see it. There are, of course, other transition where I drop from higher ones to n equals 3, and that is going to be in the infrared range. Some other things that I want you guys to know. When I look at the energy levels, what you guys will see is that the difference between n equals 1 and n equals 2 is quite large. As you go to n equals 3, the gap becomes smaller, and this progression keeps on happening. The difference between n equals 4 and n equals 3 is smaller, and n equals 5 to n equals 4 gets even tinier. So what I get is I get a clumping of energy levels the further I go out. Now with all of this said, go ahead and do this eye clicker question. All right, so the first thing I want is I want light emitted. So if light is emitted, that means I need a drop in my energy level. So I want to start out with a higher energy level and go to a smaller energy level. So what you guys will see is 2 to 3 and 2 to 4. These guys are absorption processes. So I'm not going to go ahead and pay attention to them. This first one, 3 to 2 and 4 to 2, these are drops in energy. So I'm going to go ahead and put energy here. I'm going to put n equals 1, n equals 2. I'm going to put n equals 3 a little bit closer. And then finally, n equals 4, really close to that. And so what I got is I've got an energy drop from 4 four to two, and then I've got an energy drop from three to two. So what you guys will notice is the, the higher energy drop is going from four to two. Now, if I look at my equation, energy equals hc lambda. So the higher my energy is, the shorter or smaller my wavelength is. So the four to two drop is going to have a shorter wavelength than the three to two drop. And that means that B is the correct choice. Now, one other thing before I close this lecture, and that is the sign of energy. So if I look at delta E for an emission, that means light is coming out of my atom. If I consider my atom the system, that means energy is leaving my system and so this is going to have a negative sign. If I look at delta E and I'm looking at absorption, well, light is coming into my system or into my atom. And if I have energy coming in, we are going to consider that positive. Remember, we take the point of view of the system. Energy out is always given a negative sign. Energy in is always given a positive sign. Well, Chem 1A, I hope that made sense, and remember to stay safe.